We just can't be dogmatic. So we can't be dogmatic that we shouldn't be dogmatic. <laughs> Welcome, you 9,000 lovers of freedom and the 69% of you who haven't subscribed yet to episode 2 of the Watchtower Annual Meeting. Last entry, we saw Prophet Winder explain what goes on behind the making of New Light. And in this episode, we're going to be listening to a talk by David Splain titled, Trust in the Merciful Judge of the Earth, in which David is going to remind us that we shouldn't be dogmatic. No, this is not the onion. Remember, today we're doing the cringe challenge, so if you cringe, you lose. And when you cringe, let me know the exact moment you lost it. Are you ready? It's about to get culty. By means of an angel, Jehovah God told his dear friend Abraham that he was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The angel said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is very heavy. Abraham was troubled. He apparently wondered whether Jehovah had taken all of the factors into consideration before he made that decision to destroy the cities. So he asked, will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? But have you ever asked a similar question? Maybe when you were just coming into the truth? Have you ever asked, for example, will none of those who died in the flood get a resurrection, even those who may never have heard of Noah? And what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Will everyone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah sleep an everlasting sleep? The women, the children, babies. We don't have the answer to those questions. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did I hear that right? We don't have an answer to those questions? Finally, mashallah, David Splain says the truth. For once, David finally recognized that since he and his buddies don't actually have access to the mind of God, there is no way of knowing who is going to be resurrected and who won't. But don't let the Splainer fool you. Watchtower has a long history of flip-flopping on this very same question. Sometimes Watchtower has claimed that those who were killed in the flood and Sodom will not be resurrected, and sometimes they have claimed the very opposite. Self-Aware NPC did a very excellent video on this topic on how many times Watchtower has flip-flopped on this doctrine, and Eric from Barrow and Pickett did the same thing. Both are excellent videos, so if you want a brief overview of that whole mess, you can go check them out. So I'm not gonna repeat myself, but the point is that, I mean, Watchtower has flip-flopped on this issue so many times that it gives you vertigo. But, conveniently, Splained will just kind of forget to mention all the times Watchtower has changed their mind on the matter and pretend that none of these changes ever happened. But we do know one thing. The merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? We don't have the answer to, to those questions? I thought we did. In the past, our publications have stated that there's no hope of a resurrection for those who died in the flood or those destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. But do we really know that? The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly wicked, and they deserved to die for what they did. But did they know any better? How often did Lot and his family preached to them. And are we saying that if special pioneers had been assigned to Sodom, that they would have had no success whatsoever in preaching to the Sodomites, helping them to turn around and come to a knowledge of Jehovah? Can we say dogmatically that not one Sodomite would have repented if Jehovah's requirements had been explained? Just a heads up, my dear viewer, Splain's entire talk is built solely on speculation. <laughs> he speculates that Lot and his family were preaching to the Sodomites somehow, even though the Bible never even hints at such a possibility. 
Unless by preaching you mean offering your virgin daughters to be abused by a hostile crowd, then yeah, Lot definitely did that. And then David wonders if the Sodomites would have repented if they would have been approached by special pioneers? Like, what the hell are you smoking, David? I hope you didn't plan on sending female pioneers because Lot would just have offered them up to a hostile crowd to be abused. I have two fine ass daughters with Tig old bitties who are still virgins, which is quite a remarkable feat in a city where everyone is supposed to be depraved. Look, I shall bring out my daughters and I can gang rape them instead. My treat. This is the one guy you're gonna spare? It's just amazing how David has created this entire canon in his head and just blurts it out as if it was gospel. He has lost his marbles. But what about the disciple Jude's statement that Sodom and Gomorrah would undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting fire? Well, that certainly will prove true of the cities and probably many of the inhabitants as well. But does it mean that there's no hope for any of them? Jesus' statement we just read would indicate that there is hope for some. We just can't be dogmatic. But again, we can say that the merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. So, if Jehovah always does what is right, why would he destroy people in Sodom only to resurrect them later? That would mean he inflicted unrighteous punishment on these people, right? Now let's talk about the flood of Noah's day. In the past, we've said that any who died in the flood would not be resurrected. But does the Bible say that? Now Noah's contemporaries certainly were wicked. The Bible says that man's wickedness was great on the earth and every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only bad all the time. So those living at that time were sinners. But did they all get a thorough witness? No one his family must have been very busy building the ark. How much time did they have for preaching? And were they able to do seldom worked territory? This plane just keeps applying modern JW terminology to these biblical myths, like what, seldom work territory? Really? It's just so irritating. No explain, the Bible never says that Noah was preaching to his contemporaries. It actually says the complete opposite. It says that people of the time had no idea that the flood was coming. Uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So, can we guarantee that everyone living on earth uh, during that time knew of Noah and what he was doing? We can't really say that. And can we say that if someone had been given an adequate opportunity, he still would have turned his back on Jehovah? We just can't say that. Now, of course, if Jehovah didn't bring them back, they wouldn't have any grounds for complaint. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Ugh, that is one of the worst teachings in Christianity ever. This notion that since we're all born sinners, we're all deserving of death. Such a backwards way of thinking, I'm sorry, but that way of thinking just kind of justifies all these atrocities that Splain describes in the Bible. Like, oh, God just drowned thousands of babies in the flood, but whatever, because those babies were sinners worthy of destruction. Give me a break. As you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, Jehovah could have destroyed them right away, but instead, he gave them the opportunity to have sons and daughters, and as a result, we were born. So the fact that you and I have drawn one breath is pure, undeserved kindness on Jehovah's part. Wow, how merciful. Jehovah doesn't kill us immediately for just existing. Solomon was the second wisest man ever to walk the earth. Jehovah appeared to him twice, and the second time he appeared to him, he said, if you and your sons turn away from following me and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, I will cut Israel off from the surface of the land. What did Solomon do? He began to serve other gods and bow down to them. 
How will the judge of all the earth view that? That's not for us to say. So we can't be dogmatic about the prospects of those who were said to be buried with their forefathers. It could be that the Bible was just indicating the manner of their burial. Now that isn't to say that they won't be resurrected. It simply means that we don't know. The righteous judge knows, and we know that he'll do the right thing. Splain, you are finally getting it. So now you admit that after all these years, the governing body had absolutely no reason to decide who will be resurrected and who will not. Which means they were, say it with me, say it with me Spain, they were wrong. <laughs> so when are you going to take accountability for these past mistakes? Oh wait, I forgot Prophet Windsor just said that there's no need to apologize. Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. <laughs> yes, I can definitely smell shite. I mean, Splain repeats over and over again that we shouldn't be dogmatic, but his religion is one of the most dogmatic groups on the planet, I right up there with Scientologists and Islamic fundamentalists. Well, what do we know about Jehovah? Why can we trust him to do the right thing? Well, look at the record. In the days of the prophet Joel, God's people were in a sick spiritual condition. They were worshiping the Baals and the golden calves and sacred poles. They were lying, committing adultery, stealing, shedding innocent blood, oppressing widows and orphans. Jehovah had good reason to wipe the whole nation out. And yet, what do we read at Joel 2.13? Joel says, Rip apart your hearts and not your garments, and return to Jehovah your God, for he is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loyal love, and he will reconsider the calamity. He will reconsider the calamity. After all that, Jehovah was willing to show mercy. Now this is very encouraging. Why? Many of our brothers have no trouble accepting the fact that Jehovah will forgive the sins they committed in their ignorance before they came to a knowledge of the truth. But if they've committed a sin after baptism, they're afraid that Jehovah will never forget and he will never forgive them. And yet, what do we see here? The nation of Israel was in a dedicated situation before, uh, before Jehovah, and yet Jehovah said, if you stop doing what is wrong, if you start doing what is right, I will reconsider. So the first time I listened to this talk a few weeks ago, I was wondering, what was the point of this talk? Why did David Splain bother to revise his dogma and say that now people of Sodom and the victims of the flood could be resurrected. And now it just hit me guys because it's all a pitch to get inactive ones to come back. Splain is focusing so much on Jehovah's aspect of mercy because he wants people to come back to his religion. Of course, this gradual shift towards mercy comes way too late since thousands of JWs have already been ruthlessly expelled thanks to Watchtower's dogmatic policies. So maybe David is verily realizing that rigid discipline is not the best way to keep people invested in your religion. And now he's trying to focus a bit more on mercy and forgiveness. That's my take at least. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't read the minds of these wackos as much as I would like to. Then you have the encouraging words found at Ezekiel 33. Let's read this. And I find that this is a good passage to read to uh, brothers and sisters who may feel that Jehovah could never forgive them for what they've done. Ezekiel 33, verses 14 and 16. And when I say to the wicked one, you will surely die. And he turns away from his sin and does what is just and righteous. Verse 16, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. For doing what is just and righteous, he will surely keep living. Now isn't that encouraging for someone who strayed from the truth, maybe got involved in some bad conduct, and, and far too many of these 
are afraid that Jehovah will never forgive them. They would love to come back to the truth. They would love to come back to Jehovah, but they're afraid that Jehovah is not going to accept them. And yet he says, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. Yep, what did I tell you? All these doctrinal revisions are just a way to lure people back into the cult. Who could have seen this coming? The case of King Manasseh makes the point. He was in a dedicated relationship with Jehovah, and yet for most of his life, he did what was wrong. But when he repented, turned around, and started doing what was right, Jehovah wiped the slate clean. What a marvelous, merciful God we worship. They were wicked. They did bad things. They repented. They started to do what was right and Jehovah wiped the slate clean. Well, today, power for judging has been given to someone else. There's a different judge of all the earth. Ew, no. If we take the biblical account at face value, then Manasseh was a mass murderer who filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, sacrificed his children to idols, and literally sawed the prophet Isaiah in two. Why would Jehovah forgive such a psychopath? Is this the same God that destroyed 70,000 Israelites because David carried out a census at the wrong time? Are we still talking about the same merciful judge, Splane? Jesus has been given authority to judge the living and the dead. Well, can we trust him? Can we be sure that Jesus will be merciful? Absolutely. He's the exact image of his father. And the prophet Isaiah wrote of him, he will not judge by what appears to his eyes, nor reprove simply according to what his ears hear. He will judge the lowly with fairness, and with uprightness he will give reproof in behalf of the meek ones of the earth. Well, David, I hope your Watchtower lawyers can defend you in Judgment Day because you have a lot of accounting to do. And I hope JC is in a silly good mood when he judges you. The authority that Jesus has been given includes the authority to resurrect the dead. He's the resurrection and the life. Now, you know, we often say that Jehovah God knows everything about those who have died, and that's true. But since Jesus is doing the resurrecting, it's reasonable to conclude that he also knows everything about the dead and the living. And he's going to be able to resurrect them accurately. Now, whether he'll share the power to resurrect with his anointed brothers when they're raised to heaven remains to be seen. We'll stay tuned. Wait, 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 bro. Stephen Lett already claimed that the anointed will gain the power to resurrect people. Well, Jesus and his 144,000 associate kings will have the power to completely empty the grave the common grave of dead mankind by means of the resurrection. Did you miss that new light or what? Or was Stephen Lett just being way too dogmatic for your liking? Well, what's the takeaway from this talk so far? How would you explain it to someone who wasn't here today? You would not say, someone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah and in the flood are going to be resurrected and Solomon isn't going to be resurrected. No, 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 you wouldn't say that. What we're saying is that we shouldn't be dogmatic about who will and who will not be resurrected. We just don't know. But we trust Jehovah God, we trust Jesus Christ, that they will do what is right. I know what you're thinking. The wheels are turning. And you're saying to yourself, come on, come on. We've talked about the flood. We've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. But what about the Great Tribulation? Is there anything that we can or can't say about that? You know, that's a good question. We should talk about that. You know what? I think my time is up. <laughs> yeah, just keep us in suspense, you bastard. Look at his mug little face. Oh yeah, Jeffrey, I got him real good, didn't I? I'm such a comedic genius. Thank you, Daddy Splane, for reminding us that a bunch of your previous dogmas, teachings that you treated as absolute fact, never actually had any basis. 
on the scriptures. So now, you should follow your own advice and stop being dogmatic when it comes to the blood policy and the disfellowshipping arrangement and please stop being dogmatic with your hair because that atrocious comb over is definitely not the answer. So guys, let me know what you thought of this talk in the comments below and please let me know the exact moment you lost the cringe challenge because I love reading your comments. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or by joining the YouTube channel so you can gain early access to all the upcoming episodes. This annual meeting is just getting started and it's gonna get much worse, believe me. We are almost at 10,000 subscribers guys. Once we hit that little milestone, I will be making a new question and answer special with you guys. Thank you for everything. Have a wonderful day and stay away from the tower. <laughs> Goodbye, little sheep.